Anyway, uh, today we're going to talk with uh, Joe Pulver, which I met uh, because I went to his house to try and convince him to write for an anthology we're publishing this winter. And the story he gave us was so goddamn dark and unsettling, I'm still kind of getting over it. And I'm not kidding, it's really. And uh, I thought, uh, what a better guy to have for our first event. Um, Joe, together uh, with... Uh, is a part of what we call I call uh, a new weird fiction renaissance. Uh, weird fiction starting from more pulpish magazines in the 30s, even though Joe has a bit more to say about the earlier history of that, um, developed into something which is becoming more popular, especially these days after shows like uh, True Detective went on. And suddenly people know about The King in Yellow and about Carcosa, but Joe was there way before all of those guys, and so that's going to be our little talk, I guess. And at the end, Joe is going to read us a story, so we better get drunk before, <laughs> because to deal with it. Well, they won't understand it if you're sober. You won't <laughs> And uh, then uh, you, you guys can ask me no, questions. It's not because you're not intelligent, just mm -hmm. because... Because you're sane. <laughs> yes, yeah, you're normal. <laughs> oh, so we're let's sitting? Sit. Let's sit. Okay. Or should we stand? No, we sit. sit. <laughs> and as we go on, I'll apologize up front. I have a horrible stage fright. People really scare me. <laughs> I work alone at a desk. I'm not used to people. Um, you're doing great. Because, yeah, don't because, worry. You're intelligent, because you're intelligent, you're judgmental. I don't have a very big ego, so we'll work through it together. <laughs> So, let me start off with a really annoying question. question. Where do I get my ideas from? No, no, that's me. See, right. see, like this. You put them like this. And when it's bleeding really good, you go, It's oh. all photographed. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's the right thing. Okay. It's going to be online. Everybody's going to see this. Anyway, what I want to ask is, Joe, who are you? And what is weird fiction? And how did you meet? And give us the long version. The long version. Who are you? Uh, I'm a 60-year-old bumpkin from New York. Um, I stumbled into this. I bought my first computer in the middle of the 90s. Never been around computers. Um, they were all pie in the sky when I was a kid, you know, science fiction. Um, trying to figure out how to use the word process. And I would go A, 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 B, B, C, 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 comma, cat, dog, Colon. And after a while, it was a really tough winter in upstate New York, and after a while I got sick of AAA, BBB, and I just started type sentences. <coughs> a friend came over one Friday night. Um, I had written a page, and I went out to get a couple of beers, come back, and he's like, oh, what is this? I'm like, oh, I'm trying to learn how to use a word processor. No, no, what is this? trying to figure out how to use a word process. Mm -hmm. oh, oh. What's this? I just got sick of doing AAA, BBB, CCC, you know, and he's this kind of guy who, you know, Thomas Mann, um, it, real literati intelligence. And he's like, this is almost readable. <laughs> um, huh? <laughs> Yeah, it's almost readable. So what are you going to do with it? I'm like, I haven't planned to do anything. Um, but he, he went home, and the next day I looked at it, and it's like, okay, that's page one. What the hell would I do if it was page two? And I just kept going and going. And like I said, it was a tough winter, and I just looked out the French doors, and I had nothing else to do. So as an amusement, I wrote a novel, which got published. Um, which was a Lovecraftian police procedural. Um, we have a H.P. Lovecraft is a master of horror and um, cosmic horror. You know, with these little insignificant nothings in the vastness of the universe. And he has a pseudo mythology. This great race of beings, most notable is Cthulhu. And Perhaps if we had a picture, you'd go, oh, I've seen that. It's, it's a big thing with 
an octopus head. Um, and in this pseudo-mythology, this great race of alien creatures has been banished from Earth for whatever reasons. And Cthulhu lies dead and dreaming, waiting to return and take over Earth. Um, so I decided, okay, what? These things are out there, and in some ways, insignificant mankind would see these kind of creatures, and we would see them more godlike than aliens, um, because of what they can do and their size and whatnot. And that's so I thought, well, if we're worshiping them, um, what if we had somebody who worshiped them who decided he was going to open the gates and these things to allow these things to come back to Earth? So he becomes a serial killer in the book. <laughs> book got published, you know, move along. I started, then I started writing short stories. Um, I wrote that that book? Excuse me? Nightmare's Disciple. Nightmare's Disciple. Um, it's an early work. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it, it's a pretty straightforward narrative case procedure. Um, but at the point where I had finished that and was looking for a place to have it published, I started hanging out with real writers. Because I wasn't at that point. I would never wanted to write. I'd never written anything. <clears throat> and one of them was someone named Michael Sisko, who, well, you're all relatively young. By the time you're older, he'll be a literary god. He is, for all intents and purposes, the new Kafka. No writer living is working at the level that Michael Sisko is working at. Uh, it's amazing. It's hard. It's difficult. But then again, no one said literature was supposed to be easy. I mean, pick up Moby Dick. Um, uh, so then I moved on to writing short stories. I have three collections of short stories in print. They're all weird fiction. Uh, I have another one coming next month, uh, and another one done that will be coming soon enough. I've uh, edited a couple of anthologies, that, one of which is The Grim Scribes Puppets, which is uh, all new stories in tribute to Thomas Logati, if anyone knows Thomas Logati, who's one of the living masters of weird fiction. Um, and that won Shirley Jackson Award for Anthology of the Year, which was shocking and great and surprising and uh, fun. Uh, <clears throat> How do you uh, differentiate weird fiction from horror, from science fiction, from noir, because there's a lot of noir elements as well? Mm, okay. Un under the umbrella of speculative fiction, where we can have straight horror, or science fiction, or fabulous, or fantastic fiction, or fairy tales. Um, weird is just strange fiction. I mean, it can, use, it can be dark, it, it most often is. Um, it can use elements of magical realism, or surrealist elements. Uh, Weird fiction has always been mutated. If we go back, a, a lot of people will tell you that weird fiction basically starts in, in, in the late 1800s, predominantly with ghost stories, which are strange. They you know, have one level of reality, but there's strange elements in, woven into them that make them not everyday normal. Um, and since then, as we get new writers writing their own thing, they're bringing other things to this. So weird fiction is kind of like a nest. And every new writer adds another part to the nest. So weird fiction absorbs what's around it when noir appears. Starts to go, oh, wow, that's interesting stuff. And I could do mean streets, down and out, I could put a ghost in there. Weird fiction can be anything the writer imagines. And as we've moved along in the last, in, in this century, 
weird fiction has really expanded because you have all kinds of writers. Um, and their influences aren't just Poe and Lovecraft and Stephen King. They'll read Beckett. I love Beckett. Um, uh, I steal from Beckett uh, <laughs> when I can get away with it. Um, these, are, these are writers who love Dostoevsky. They love Nabokov. Um, so we're, the influences are becoming further out and further out and further out. There's a lot more writers working nowadays that read outside of the box. It, at, at one point, a lot of weird fiction writers were reading predominantly other weird fiction or other horror. And that's what they reflected in their work. It's like, wow, Stephen King is incredible. I'm going to write a book just like Stephen King. I don't want to read your idea of Stephen King. I want to read Stephen King write Stephen King. You, you write? Then I want to read what, what you've got to tell me. If you're any good, I want to read you. Or you. Um, I'm Bart Echo. We'll pick on him for a second. It's great. Don't write an Alberto Echo book because you can't do it as good as he can. But if you're any good, you can do what you can better than he can if he copies you. And that's what I want to read. Weird fiction is just getting more and more inclusive. Uh, it, incl it can include horror, ghost stories. You can have a weird fiction tale set in the future. On a spaceship, if you want. Um, there, there are no more genre restrictions. Slipstream literature came along, and all those things that don't fit. You know, I mean, if we write a, a werewolf novel, and it's a straight horror werewolf novel, okay, it's horror. It may not necessarily be weird fiction, but it easily can be. Um, a few years ago, I forgot the guy's name, there was a book called. I'm not even going to remember the name of the book. L.A. Noir. It was written as like a 400 page poem, um, which charmed me to no end. Um, and it's, a, it's about a group of werewolves that are hunting in L.A. On one level, it's pure poetry. On another level, it's, it's hard boiled. On another level, it's weird fiction. Weird fiction is very that um, and utilizes whatever's around. Whatever that particular writer finds interesting or fascinating. You know, I've noticed in weird fiction, you said about writers adding to the nest. Yeah. And about everybody doing their own different thing. But in weird fiction, unlike most other forms of literature, there is a lot of metafiction going on between the writers There's exchanging changing. ideas. Yeah. How did, where did that come from? I'm assuming in the early Lovecraft circle. Well, in the, in the first Lovecraft, H.P. Lovecraft. When, when he was developing his pseudo-mythology and his fiction, had fans because H.P. Lovecraft was one of the most popular writers in, in Weird Tales, which was America's number one strange magazine. And Robert Bloch, who's the author of Psycho, I'm sure everyone here knows the film Psycho, a brilliant book, um, was 14 years old. And he was reading weird fiction, and he was reading weird tales. He read Lovecraft and loved Lovecraft. And he started at 14 years old, corresponding with H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft corresponded back. And Bloch began to write stories utilizing elements of Lovecraft's fiction. So did another guy. So Lovecraft builds up this correspondence with other writers. And they start borrowing, you know. And it's like, oh, I'm working on a story. Oh, I'm here. Yeah, I need a character. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, he's going to die. Oh, wait, wait, see how he dies with this one. Oh, he's going to start killing me. It's all parlor games. So, and a lot of that goes on. Now, it's, I've killed my friends in stories. So, my friends get their names mangled in one form or another. Um, it's, we all write alone. So it's, it's, it's a way to do something that's connected. That, you know, we, we don't get to see each other that much 
we don't get to hang out with them as much as we do, so we're just playing with each other. You know, we're like 14-year-old kids who are at summer camp. But there's also, there's even something more than that. Like, for instance, Lovecraft invented many uh, obscure books which were then used and added, and even Stephen King, I know you oh, yeah, that's some yeah. books you uh, invented by Bach. Uh, I, I, every, almost everybody who's written Lovecraftian fiction, Lovecraft invented a book, it's called the Necronomicon. It's this ancient, which is grimoire. It's, you know, like 1,100 pages of spells to call these things up and release them from their prisons and destroy the earth and humanity. Um, so Lovecraft invented the Necronomicon. And another writer invented another book similar to the Necronomicon. And another one, it, it, it's, it almost got to be a point where if you were going to write utilize Lovecraft's pseudo-mythology, you would invent your own creature. You know, Lovecraft had Nair Lathotep and he had Cthulhu and a number of you know. Um, when I wrote my novel, I decided that I would have a creature, and I called it Kasagva. And it's about the size of Godzilla, and it looks like a mass of writhing snakes. It has no head. On the end of it, it's just a hole with teeth in it, like a lamprey would be. Um, and it's covered in vaginas. Because it's a female. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> well, maybe for you, you know. You <laughs> know. Uh, so just a part of the parlor game, in, in, in a way to amuse ourselves as, as you know. <clears throat> Speaking of vaginas, <laughs> I don't have one thing. That's fine. But uh, a lot of criticism regarding, for instance, Lovecraftian fiction, and this goes also over to science fiction in its early days, and even horror, is where are the women? And you know, many people say, well, Cthulhu is the only representation of the female genitalia. But that's not true. Show Ingerath the black goat of the, of the woods with a thousand young. It is fertility. She's got a thousand babies running around after her. Yeah, okay. Where are the women? The women, the right? women, the women have always been here. Um, where, where do we keep our copy of Frankenstein? That's right, so written by have... someone named Mary Shelley. She had a vagina. Mm -hmm. Apparently it was good. There was a number of guys there in Geneva that were interested in it. Um, is there more quintessential work of science fiction, of weird fiction, of horror than Frankenstein? There is not. Um, in the pulp era, you're talking about Lovecraft, you're talking about weird tales. Mm -hmm. oh, let's see, C.L. Moore, Gyro of Jewelry, these are amazing works. Um, Lay Bracket, Lay Bracket, you might know as one of the screenwriters for Star Wars. When Lay Brackett was first hired, because in the old days in Hollywood, Hollywood loved to get real writers to write screenplays. Okay? And here we are at one of the studios, and somebody's like, well, hire this Lee Brackett, give me that guy. Okay? Phone calls are made, blah, 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 and one morning Lee Brackett shows up at the offices and there's Jack Warner at his desk with his coffee, with his cigar. And Lee Brackett walks in the office and sits down and he looks up and it's like, who are you? Because Lee Brackett sits down and she's a very lovely young woman in a nice dress. And he thought Lee was a guy. She's written some amazing work. We've, we, we've always had women, they just haven't been featured. They haven't been promoted as much. Um, there are, in Lovecraftian fiction especially, most of the, most of the people that discover this material discover it in, in their teen years. Um, less and less so these days, because we have a lot more women who are into superheroes and science fiction and, and all kinds of geekery, which is cool. Um, but in the old days, it seemed like we had less women interested in those subjects. 
Um, so it seemed like there were less women participating, contributing. Um, are, were there powers that be that didn't want women to play the game? There might have been. There probably were some. Hopefully not as many as is suspected. Um, but I think the walls are starting to finally come down. The, the, in this weird fiction renaissance, which we are in one, you're entirely correct, um, the talent pool is vast. And many, many of the best and most important writers working are women. Uh, great you are now uh, you're editing an anthology of women's fiction. Right, right. And I wonder, do you think there's any kind of difference between how men view word fiction and uh, the fantastic and how women view it? Some. Un unfor unfortunately, we, we may be in the 21st century, but we haven't come as far as I would have liked in 1970 when I was a kid and had all those Woodstock <coughs> dreams. Um, what happened in Indiana? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, you know, black people still suffer terribly. Gays suffer terribly. Uh, so, do women get discriminated against? Yes, they do. Um, uh, one of the things I like in the weird fiction community is I think there's a very strong element, and I'm just one of the small pieces. Um, we're damn sick of that. I'm interested in what's the next really cool book, okay? Now, here I am, I'm a straight old white guy. You know, and you take a whole bunch of straight old white, yeah. we're valuable too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, hey, you know, there's, so, so, I got a particular outlook. You're half my age. You're from a place halfway across the world from me. Your sexual persuasion is completely different from mine. So when you write, you bring something that I can. I am not you. I didn't live your life. I, I maybe can take a look at it. And maybe if I'm good, I can experience some of it. But, but for you to come to the table, you're going to give me a completely new vision. And this young lady, for her to sit down at the typewriter and cook it, her plumbing's different. So right at the get-go, she can bring something to the table that I can't. Okay? Um, are you from here? I'm not. I'm from Boston. Well, well shit. Well, we go. <laughs> Forget it. You can leave that. Is, are there any women from Germany here? Uh, no. Um, Boston's cool. It's, it's only a three and a half hour drive from where I used to live. But your vision, your experience is going to be different from mine. You're from a sort of different place, not really. Um, it's not much different between upstate New York and New England. Um, but take them here. It is one of the finest writers working. Uh, a couple, few years back, she had a novel called The Red Train, uh, which I thought was the novel of the year. Uh, I also think it's like the finest unreliable narrator novel I've read in at least 10 years. Um, Caitlin Kiernan uh, is a lesbian. She's from the South. She's 25 years younger than I am. Her perspective is she's been rock and roll bands. I'm just a listener. Um, she's got a whole different set of viewpoints, experiences. She brings things to the table that I can't, that other writers can't. And that's what I want. I want fresh new approaches. You got topics. You know, we got all kinds of different writers here. We can walk around and Maybe we go over there and we find Beckett, and we come over here and we find Walter Mosley. Walter Mosley's got different perspectives than I have. Thank God. <laughs> um, you know, and that's why we're reading. We're, we read for entertainment, and I still do on occasion, not often. But we also read to connect. I think even when we're reading for entertainment, we're still looking to connect. 
So I want to see what you think. I know what I think. I want to be able to judge things, to maybe play with the values. I need to know what other people think, how they see it. Um, I wanted to ask, you said um, also many people start uh, having this obsession, and I do kind of consider it an obsession with weird fiction in a good way, of course, uh, as teens. And I was wondering, in this weird fiction renaissance that's going on now, work is becoming much more demanding than what uh, you, yeah. you mentioned, Cisco, your yeah. own works. These are not stuff you read, uh, you know, um, in the bathroom, even if, you, of course, you can. But you have to concentrate. You have to. They're not spoon feeding you or anything. That's uh, right. How do you? Who reads this stuff? Because you know, I'm thinking about that <coughs> intellectual literati. And they went, well, I don't want this. This has te tentacles. No, because we're the bastard children. They don't even want to let us in. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, yeah. they don't want to let us in the back door, let alone in the room. And then you got the, you know, the people who want just a good, gory time, a fun time, and they might not totally get, you know, Cisco. Well, no, they're going to read the more mainstream stuff. They're, they're going to go to the easier, easier stuff. And yet, uh, weird fiction is kind of booming lately. It is. People are talking about it. It's happening. But, but you have Lear Barron, mm -hmm. you have Caitlin Kiernan. We have any number of really brilliant writers who are writing real literature. It may look like weird fiction, it may weird uh, read like weird fiction, but this is literature literature. No one ever said literature was supposed to be easy. If someone told you that, they lied. Moby Dick is not easy. I, and, yet, and yet really brilliant literature can be easy. I would say To Kill a Mockingbird is not difficult. Mm -hmm. um, still brilliant literature. Um, we, we have tons of great people. We, like I said, our influences are different. Yeah, we love Pulp. I mean, I grew up reading Doc Savage books. Does anybody know Doc Savage? Doc Savage is sort of like Superman, but it wasn't a comic book character. And he was all golden, and he was a great scientist, and he had five guys he used to run with. One was a brilliant lawyer, and one was the best engineer on Earth, and the other was uh, the best chemist on Earth, and the other was a weapons expert. And they went all over, the, and Doc Savage was richer than God, and a philanthropist, and he had super, almost superhuman strength, um, and he had cool weapons, and he went all over the world saving the planet from all kinds of skullduggery. And these were great pulp novels. I love those. But somewhere along the line, it's like, oh, here's Beckett, and somewhere along the line, here's Nabokov, and somewhere along the line, Here's this and this and this. And as we continue to read and want more, well, we get our sea legs. So we can move on. And, you know, whether it's Frank Herbert's Doom, easy or maybe not easy to read, depending. Lord of Rings, <coughs> you're looking for more. And not just the next new voice, but I think more this way as far as as well as expanding that way. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you. Many people know about H.P. Lovecraft, for instance. He's a rather uh, popular pop culture figure. But you made a very strong name for yourself within the mythos of Robert W. Chambers, which what I believe to be I. The way I see it is a bit more esoteric, more for the real people who know. And only lately, with True Detective, The King in Yellow popped up. Could you tell us a little bit about Chambers and King in Yellow mythos? Sure, you have, to, you have to go back and start at Ambrose Pierce. But, um, and Ambrose Pierce has a couple of very, very short stories. And in them, we see the beginnings of uh, Cosmic War. The idea that we are completely and utterly insignificant 
in this vast cosmos. And we are. I mean, go home and put a DVD in. Go home and put in Lawrence of Arabia. There's that scene where we're looking out into the desert, and way back there is a tiny black dot, and it's Omar Sharif, and he's coming this way. Look at that expanse of desert. If, if, if we were, if one of us was dropped down in it right now, all by ourselves, we're nothing compared to that. And that's just a little tiny patch on Earth. Put us in a rowboat in the middle of the Atlantic by ourselves. We're nothing. Nothing whatsoever against just the power of the sea. And that's just the Atlantic. So what is a single human being in the entirety of the universe? We're, less, we're, we're nothing more than an atom. And the sea, the desert, the cosmos doesn't give a rat's ass about us. When, when I die, when you die, when we all die, when mankind is gone, there's still going to be a universe. It won't remember we're here. It, it doesn't care. So that kind of cosmicism has its birth in Ambrose Spears. Lovecraft borrowed from it and adapted it in a form to the Cthulhu mythos. Robert Chambers took some of the names that um, Ambrose Spears used in these two short stories and the idea of this cosmicism and created the King and Yellow. Uh, the King and Yellow's book it came out in 1895. It has 10 short stories, four of which deal with the King and Yellow. Um, excuse me. So that's the King and Yellow is that, a real life book. Within these four stories, you also have a character that's the King and Yellow. And you also have a play called a fictitious play called The King of the Yellow. It's a play um, that takes place long ago and far away, perhaps in an alternate universe. Um, and that place is called Carcosa. It's saturated in ennui. Um, the play is in two acts. Supposedly, and Chambers never writes the whole play. Throughout these four stories, all he gives us is little snippets. You know, just a couple of things from Act 1, Scene 2. Here's something from Act 2, Scene 4. You know, here's something from Act 2, Scene 1. Supposedly, when you read the entirety of the play, you will go mad. Okay? Um, that's why I never wrote the play, because there's no way you can write a play that after you read it, or after you read it, you're stark raving murderous nuts. And most often the characters, <coughs> excuse me, uh, one of the stories that, one of these four stories that Chambers wrote actually has a painter in his model. And they discover the play, they read the play, they both wind up dead. It's you know, murder, suicide. Um, and so the play drives people nuts. Uh, but it's mystery. Chambers doesn't give us much. He continues to tell us how powerful this play is. And we see through the characters, through their actions, um, how dangerous it is. But because it's, it's almost like Hannibal in Silence of the Lambs. He's only on screen for three minutes. But he seems like the whole film, because you just get a little tiny bit, and you're struggling to figure out all the holes. Once you get like five books into the series, and we find out, you know, his horrible, shitty life when he was a little kid, and it's all explained when we find out why, what his pathos is, and why he's that demented. All the mysteries go on. He's kind of boring. That's one of the big things with the King of Yellow. So you think uh, for you, the, it's the mystery? It's the mystery, but, but it's also the madness. Uh, most horror writers write about what they're afraid of. I know some people write body horror. Uh, 
not afraid of body horror. Uh, some people are afraid of spiders. I'm afraid of going mad. I'm afraid of losing my mind. Um, I guess I'm a control freak. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, uh, Poe. I had read Poe before I discovered Chambers. The Telltale Heart, The Cask of Amontillado. These guys are nuts. They're scary ass nuts. It's like, wait a minute, this guy's like sitting there talking and there's like cut up parts under the floor where he's sitting there. Oh yeah, yeah, I was here, man, no problem. Whoa, what the hell is that shit? That bothered me. Um, so, and also Robert Block, Psycho. Psycho's based on serial, real silly serial killer. And Dean, and Dean was making lamps out of people's skin. I mean, he was doing shit that bothered me. Well, serial killers weren't common when I was a little kid. It's like, whoa, what is this? This is, there can't really be people like this. And then it's like, oh, just like her. Just nice, looks like a nice young woman. All her neighbors love her, so she's so quiet, she always says hi. And she's got fucking heads and a freaking Huh? That's a mask. You wear a mask. You wear a mask. We all wear masks. I'm really interested in what's behind the mask. I'm really scared of what's behind it because it can be it can be something wonderful. And yet when we learn about Ed Gein, or when we learn about Jeffrey Dahmer, or whatever. Unfor this plane that just crashed. There was something behind that mask. It just cost 100, 150 people their lives. You know, children, that's horrible. I'm really interested in madness. That's the thing that scares me. That's the thing that draws me to chambers. That's what I... That's why I write so much King and Yellow in this material. I want to explore madness. Why do you think Chambers was not as popular as, uh, or not is as popular as Lovecraft or <clears throat> his friends? It's its own. All right, Robert W. Chambers, short version, was a great painter. American, upstate New York, my neck of the woods, back in. The 1800s, trained in New York for a while, had a, going to have a dynamite career. He, as a young man, went to the Beaux Arts in Paris. He was the youngest person to ever be premiered at the Beaux Arts. He was handed the keys to the kingdom as a painter, and all of a sudden, a letter from home says, "You went to Europe. You sowed your wild oats. Come on home." And here's his dream. He's this close to being a god. And he's called home to be a regular old god. So he comes home, he starts writing. His first couple of books are basically love letters to Paris. Um, and he keeps writing. And at that point, historic travelogues were very popular. Um, he writes a couple of those. They sell really well. One thing all writers need then, now, a hundred years from now, money. There are very few Harry Potters, there are very few Stephen Kings. Uh, most of us are worried about paying the power bill next month. Well, this month, to be honest as well. Um, there's not a lot of money in it. You do it because you love it. You're stupid enough to love it. Um, and so Chambers be became, in his era, the best-selling writer, period. He wrote 200 bestsellers. In his time, he was bigger than Stephen King and, and J.K. Rawlings and Daniel Steele and about five other writers all rolled up in one. He made a fortune. His dream had been taken away from him, so he took the money instead and just phoned in all the rest of his books. 
That's why he's not remembered. Mm -hmm. He's remembered for these four stories because of their impact in the weird fiction community. They have always been respected um, by a handful of people. I'm just the current one, and I got a big mouth. <laughs> and after 15 years of me screaming about Chambers, I'm finally getting somewhere. And True Detective helped out, and I think they did a great job. Do you consider True Detective as part of the Chambers <clears throat> mythos? No, they just utilized it in a certain way. In a way, I don't, but I think they did a great job with it. I was thrilled to death mm -hmm. if it brought Robert Chambers to the public's eye, great. And we also sold a shitload of uh, season in Carcosa because- Which we it, also have, by the way. It, um, because <laughs> A, True Detective was hot, and it's like, hey, what, there's a whole book of this Carcosa shit. I wonder if it's any good. Yeah. Um, Wonderful. And supposedly, it's pretty good. As editor, I can't say that. Yeah, sure. Um, um, I wanted to ask something, like a last question. Um, about, I talked to you earlier about what differentiates when we're outside between now <coughs> science fiction and horror and weird fiction, and I thought there was this philosophical core to it, which is, I, there can't be. Because, for instance, I just want to say about Drew Detective and Thomas Legotti, for instance. Legotti uh, has this philosophy. He's a of, philosophical writer, yeah. Of deep nihilism, which fits not so badly with, uh, I'm, we're nothing in the universe, we don't make any sense, nobody needs us. Right. Uh, how do you, is this your viewpoint in life? Do you think all weird fiction that takes this viewpoint? No. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's easy. Um, horror and crime, or horror and noir, are great bedfellows on the page. They go together. Existentialism and weird fiction, if you just fit together perfectly. I mean, it's like a couple coming together, you know? They melt just right. So, but um, it doesn't have to be. There's, you can have a ghost story that's just a ghost story. And there are many that are brilliant. Um, but you can have a ghost story that has philosophical or metaphysical elements. That's easy. It all depends on what the writer's intent is. Um, you've got House of Leaves out in the window over there. Yeah. Great! For all intents and purposes, Haunted House book. Perhaps the best one that's come out in the last 25, 30 years. I would argue it is, but, you know, uh, there's a lot of heavy philosophy in there. And there's a lot that isn't. It's what the writer wants to bring in. That, yeah, because, because a lot of us are reading different things. We're reading Nabokov, and we're reading Beckett, and we're reading Kafka. You know? Yeah, that stuff sneaks in. It's dark. Beckett is funnier than shit. And he's dark. You know? Um, so that come, we bring it along. Cool, Joe. Before I will ask you to read something for us, could you tell us what you're working on these days? Um, I have a new collection of weird fiction coming out next month. It's called The House of Hollow Wounds. I have a second one done. I'm working on a number of a number of anthologies. One is another. Um, tribute to Robert W. Chambers in The King in Yellow, and it's called Casilda Song, and it is all women writers. So I want to hear what women have to say about The King in Yellow. <coughs> um, one I'm working on is called Born Under a Bad Sign, like the blues song, born, I was born under a bad sign, I've been down since I began to crawl. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have no bad luck at all. <laughs> And uh, this is weird fiction meets noir. Uh, I'm quite pleased with the uh, writers who have said that they'll submit. Um, I'm working on a tribute to Michael Sisko, an anthology that'll be a tribute to Michael Sisko. 
and I'm working on a novel-length round robin. It's called The Leaves of a Necronomicon. Um, What's a round robin? A round robin is what? It normally is short stories. You write part one, and you end, and Joe left the store and turned right, and now I pick up the story. And when I get down to the end of the block, oh, I met a girl. And when she turned, the light flickered, and I could see she had fangs. So I'm in the next writer. So I write and then leave it somewhere. And you know, normally it has a theme, a subject, but a number of writers. Well, this is novel length. And what this is, is in 1895, someone commissioned someone to create a Necronomicon a copy of this evil book. So, chapter one, here's the creation of the book. Chapter two, the book is handed over to the person who commissioned it. And for the next 125 years, we're going to watch the book change hands. Place to place, person to person. Every chapter will be told by a different writer in a completely different voice. Very few of the chapters will be interconnected. So at one point, you're a screenwriter in 1940, and you found this book at a police auction, and your career is in the shitter. And you thought, wow, I can make a really scary movie out of this stuff in here. So you run home with this book, and you're going to cook up this great screenplay, and you're going to get rich, and you're going to be back on top. I'm sorry, you lose. So, and the book changed hands. You, you have the book for some period of time. And then you have a heart attack. Oh, somebody comes in. Oh, actually, you don't have any relatives. So <laughs> your landlord goes, look at all the shit in this apartment, and throws it all out in a dumpster. So the book, <laughs> and, and the book moves on to whoever finds it in the dumpster. And that's all this is, is to watch this book move through 120 years, from its creation to perhaps its demise. Um, it's a lot of fun. Not, not the demise. Yeah. And, and I mean, Lovecraft, Lovecraft's work is, is odd. So even though this is linear, there's a timeline, does, it doesn't, I mean, at one point, Here's the book. It's in this location, owned by this person. And that person dies. Next chapter. You don't know why it got to this person. Mm -hmm. It just, here's what happened when this person owned this book. Much like an Annie Cruz accordion in Crimes, which is the exact same thing. The red violin. It's, 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 it's an old trope to watch an item move from hand to hand in hand. And I just love it, and I wanted to do it with a Necronomicon, that's all. Great. <laughs> uh, so, uh, what are you going to read for us today, Joe? Mm -hmm. This took two weeks to figure out what to read. 